So today we're fortunate enough to have Les Brand, Les Brand of Amplitude Consultants presenting to us on voltage source converter HVDC. Les is an electrical engineer with over 26 years of experience in the transmission and distribution industry in Australia, Asia and the USA. He's the co-founder and managing director of Amplitude Consultants based here in Brisbane, Queensland. He has held key technical and project management roles for a number of HVDC projects, including DirectLink, MurrayLink and BassLink, all within Australia, as well as Transbay Cable, uh, which was conducted in California in the United States of America. In the voltage source converter world, some of these projects represented significant milestones in the development of VSC technology, including the first VSC interconnector, which was direct link, and the first high voltage multi-level modular converter or MMC project, which was the Transbay cable. Currently, Les is leading a number of HVDC engagements in Australia and overseas. Les was the convener of the Seagray Australia panel for HVDC and power electronics, which is uh, study committee B4, until 2019, and was the convener of the working group B463, uh, which looked into commissioning of voltage source converter HVDC systems, uh, and resulted in the publishing of technical brochure 697 in late 2017. Les is currently the convener of the IEC Technical Committee 99 JMT7, which is responsible for IEC 61936-2 related to DC installations. Les is a joint recipient for the National Professional Engineer of the Year Award for 2020, uh, which was awarded by Engineers Australia. Uh, so we'd like to, to formally, Les, welcome you uh, and thank you for your time today. Really appreciate you uh, volunteering your time and presenting to us. So with that, Les, I'll assign you to be presenter and hopefully without any technical issues, you should be able to, to share your slide. All right, give me a sec and... Fantastic. Yeah, we've got we've got you there. So the, the floor is yours, right. Les. Thanks very much. Okay, no problem. Thanks, Matt. Thanks for the introduction and good afternoon, everyone. Um, and there's no problem at all doing something like this. I get to talk to an audience for an hour on hour and a half on what is actually my favorite topic, which is voltage source converters, HVDC. Um, now this this uh, this webinar. It was originally intended to be, or is still intended to be, one part of a series of webinars uh, delivered to the NGN from members of SIGRAY B4, which is um, DC and power electronics, and and to try and try and provide some kind of uh, information on 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 the, this kind of stuff that we do in B4. Uh, so this VSC presentation or webinar is is actually quite high level. There's a lot of information to get into the uh, to get into uh, and we'll cover everything at a reasonably high level. We will take, as, as Matt said, we will take questions at the end. Um, but also, you know, have a think about if if there are any particular parts of this presentation that, that there's, uh, there's a general um, a demand for a, a deeper dive, a, uh, a more detailed webinar, then please keep that in mind as, as we go through the, uh, go through the presentation. So just give me a sec while I sort out my um, my screen here. Okay, that's much better. Okay, good. So the the agenda for today. Okay. So what? Okay. So so this is the agenda for today's webinar. We're going to provide an introduction to HVDC in general talk about HVDC technologies and topologies and the, the history and development of, of HVDC uh, transmission. Then we'll go into voltage source conversion. What is voltage, what are VSC converters? What do they do? How do they work? How do they compare to the, the more traditional um, technology, which is LCC, as I will explain in a, in a little while. 
Then we'll talk a little bit about VSCs with overhead lines. The majority, if all but one VSC project in the world is um, using underground cables. So let's, we'll, talk, we'll touch on what the issues are with overhead lines and how they can be resolved. Talk about VSC applications and, uh, and a couple of slides on the end on some recent developments and innovations that are coming through. So HVDC, what is it? High voltage direct current. It, in its most basic form, it's the point to point transmission of power from one end to the other, converting it from AC to DC at one converter station, which we will call the rectifier, transmitting it in DC to the inverter and then converting it back to AC at the inverter. In between, you have a DC transmission line or a cable. Now, the choice of DC transmission medium will often depend on the application and the technology that you, you have chosen. Overhead lines tend to be used for large power, long distance applications. Underground cables, submarine cables, are primarily used when overhead lines are not possible. For example, trying to cross la la large water masses or in environmentally sensitive areas. This webinar will not discuss in detail uh, overhead line and cable applications, we'll touch on them, but but generally what we are talking about here uh, is how the HVDC system works and particularly converter stations. Okay, so why do we use HVDC? Well, it depends on the application, but there are, there are a number of key reasons for HVDC over a, say an AC option. Uh, lower transmission lines, uh, sorry, lower transmission losses is one of the big ones. So long distance transmission. So yes, the converter stations are quite lossy. The switching of power electronic devices generates heat, requires cooling and generates heat losses. So that's a fact. The technology is improving in that area, but still compared to an AC substation, that's generally the case. But on the, on the DC transmission side, so the, the cables and the overhead lines in between, um, the losses tend to be much, much lower. So you can imagine, and you've probably seen the graphs that are around, that are available on, online that show there is some kind of break even point where the additional cost and the additional loss of the converter stations um, will, will, out, will outweigh the, uh, will, will um, take over as the preferred technology over AC and uh, in terms of distance, all right? Um, the second point there is longer lengths of underground or submarine cable. So typically with AC cables, there's, there's a, there are limitations to how long you can run your AC cable before you need to start installing a significant amount of um, a reactive plant or compensation along the way. And of course that gets worse um, as, as you get up to the higher voltages. So there's a, there's generally a rule of thumb, you know, depending on the voltage, sort of 50 kilometers, 100 kilometers, where it's just not practical to run that point-to-point -point transmission in AC using using cables. So th this is where HVDC often comes to the fore, and particularly where you have a long stretch of water. If you can imagine Basslink, where the the stretch of water there is about 300 kilometers, uh, it's just it gets to the point where DC can be the only option. The third one is lower transmission costs. So, you know, stating the obvious, if it's a bipole system or a symmetric monopole system, there are only two conductors or two cables rather than three. So there's, there's an immediate saving there. But the DC cable and lines tend to have smaller conductor sizes, lower metal costs, but, um, and you know, the towers tend to be smaller for overhead lines. So you can, you can actually get some good cost benefits there. Controllability of active power flow. So a converter station is more or less, you type in how, how many megawatts you want delivered at your connection point and it will produce that subject to availability at the, uh, at the source. And then the final one, which is not, not as relevant here, but it is a, it is a reason uh, connecting to non-synchronized AC networks. Um, when we connect a direct link, there was no interconnection between Queensland and New South Wales, for example. So the DC connection allowed that um, that connection. Uh, two 
another good example is Japan, where a significant amount of the um, of the, uh, the the country is is in 50 hertz, and another part of the country is in 60 hertz. So they they often use HVDC converters between the two networks as back-to-back -back converters to um, to allow that connection. So in terms of technologies, there are two major technologies. There are variants of these, of course, but um, major technologies for HVDC transmission, line commutator converters, LCC. Uh, I'll refer to them as LCC in this webinar. Often referred to now as conventional or classic HVDC. It's, uh, of course, until VSC came along, it was only referred to as HVDC. Uh, they utilise thyristor valves to commutate the current instead of uh, IGBTs, which are, which are used by voltage source converters. The technology has been around since the mid 1950s. Uh, the early um, thyristors have been used since the early 1970s. Prior to that, they used mercury arc valves, which I understand all of them now are, are decommissioned and in some way replaced with, with the thyristor. From an Australian perspective, if you think about the HVDC links that we have here in Australia, uh, we have two, um, Direct Link and Murray Link, uh, both VSC converters, whereas BassLink is an LCC converter. And um, across the ditch into New Zealand, the New Zealand HVDC link is an LCC converter. So VSC, it, it uses IGBTs, um, it's self-commutating. So the thyristors and the LCC require, use the, the AC voltage to turn on and turn off and that can lead to some issues which we'll mention a little bit later but a VSC is self-commutating the IGBTs are switched on and off under the direction of a control system the however the, the VSC is the new kid on the block it's it was first introduced commercially in Sorry, I might have had a little bit of a blip there. Can uh, Matt, can you hear me? Yeah, we've got you as we did lose you for a second or two there, but you're back yeah. clear now. Okay, sorry about that. So um, VSC Technologies and New Kid on the Block, it was first introduced commercially in 1997. Uh, originally, it was considered as a technology suitable for small power application. And you know, at the time in the late 90s, HVDC was only associated with large power, long distance power transmission. And you know, that's pretty much a, 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 uh, driven by the, the overall cost and magnitude of, of LCC technology at the time. But over time, they you know, people started realizing there were actually some, some unique applications for VSC, and it's actually been developing pretty, pretty fast. And right now, Transmission levels of 1,000 megawatts, 2,000 megawatts are not only possible, but also under construction. Okay. Um, right, common configurations. So still talking about HVDC in general, but we have common configurations here. Monopole, bipole, symmetric monopole. And some people will be quite used to to these these terms um, and uh, but just very quickly a monopole has one high voltage conductor here and a uh, an earth return now or sorry uh, yeah an earth return now that that return is either through the earth as shown here but with the dash line it can also be a metallic return if ground current is for whatever reason, um, not not possible. Now, ground return is becoming increasingly difficult to obtain permitting for, um, particularly for marine environments. Uh, there are some jurisdictions in the world that still allow the use of ground return. In some cases, they only limit it to short periods. Like, for example, if you get a if you get a uh, a trip in a bipole, it might allow you to operate in ground return for a short period of time. But generally speaking. A monopole system nowadays has a metallic, a dedicated metallic return, which have, which effectively means two cables, and two cables carrying the same amount of current, but of different voltage. 
so the, the metallic return cable or, or overhead line can be quite quite a much lower voltage, like a medium voltage level. The the benefit of a monopole is quite it's relatively cheap. You know, you only need two cables instead of three compared to a bipole. Um, the the disadvantage is that if you lose the converter or you lose the cable, you've lost a hundred percent of your link. So there's no redundancy in the system. Um, and of course, if you try to put in a ground return instead and just get away with one cable, then you're going to have you may have issues with the ground return, um, uh, such as uh, electrode erosion, uh, parallel buried me metallic structures, um, the magnetic saturation of transformers, and then there are the environmental impacts that uh, that people talk about. Um, bipole. <clears throat> so the bipole looks like this. It's it's two monopoles, asymmetric monopoles connected. Uh, it has two converters instead of one. If this bipole and this monopole had the same, was the same megawatt cap uh, capacity, each converter here would be 50% um, um, of, of the overall power. It has an inherent redundancy. So if you get a fault in, in say this high voltage cable, then you could have some switching in here that will allow you to operate in monopole mode for a while. Of course, the same question comes about, do you have a metallic return or do you have a ground return uh, during that period? But it, it can provide this 50% capacity. Uh, the, down, the downfall is, or the, the, the con is that higher costs, you've got twice the converters. Yes, they're half the rating, but there, there's just generally more infrastructure. Um, and you may require a metallic return. So, you know, you may need three cables. For short cables, it's probably not an issue. If you've got longer cables, that may become a problem. And the, the last one is the, the symmetric monopole, uh, which direct link and, and, uh, and Murray link are both symmetric monopoles. So a symmetric monopole is basically a positive and a negative uh, pole uh, cable. There's no, there's no return, there's no ground current, there's no return. It, it, doesn't, uh, it doesn't need the uh, the shift in polarity of voltage to cause power to uh, to change direction and therefore it's predominantly a, a, v, a VSC type um, configuration. It has a couple of benefits. You know, if you put uh, compared to a monopole for the same megawatt level, it has half the current. So that allows you to get away with smaller cables, smaller conductors, perhaps. It it suffers the same problem as a monopole though, as in you, you get a fault in the cable or the converter and you are 100% out. And, uh, but it also has this benefit of you being able to use standard AC transformers instead of, instead of HVDC converter transformers, which, uh, which you know, the, the DC voltage stresses and the, uh, and the design of, of these transformers are actually quite complicated and therefore quite expensive. And there's, a relatively small number of manufacturing facilities that can build them. Now, the last one is is this new configuration that everyone's talking about, which is a rigid bipole. Now, a rigid bipole is one hasn't been commissioned yet, but there are three under construction right now in in uh, in, in Europe: NSL, Nordlink, and Viking. And most of these projects are actually very long cables, circa 700 kilometres. So what the what a rigid bipole effectively is is a bipole without um, without either an either an electro earth electrode or a metallic return. And the idea here is if you get a fault in a convert in one of the converters, which is possibly more likely than a submarine cable fault, for example, the high speed switches on the DC side will will very very quickly bypass the faulty converter. And, and allow the system to operate as a monopole at half capacity without having to put in either an earth electrode or a metallic return. So this leads to um, basically you save on one cable and hence that's why it's very popular with the very long distance uh, converter uh, projects like, like the examples I just mentioned, 700 kilometres plus. There is still a question as to how fast these DC switches can operate. 
is can it operate at the moment the, the, there are quotes of you know a couple of seconds now is a couple of seconds fast enough to avoid issues on the on the ac network in the event of a converter trip that really depends on your application and it will depend on your um, your the network that you're connecting to so hvdc this very quickly this is a, a timeline of the development of hvdc uh, the green dashed line in the middle here refers to when VSC more or less became commercially available at transmission levels. So you can see here the first HVDC was actually in Sweden 1954. New Zealand wasn't too far behind in 1965. First thyristor valves and then basically things got bigger and larger voltage up to this point where the first voltage source converter was installed in Gotland, Sweden in 1999. Uh, we were very, we as in Australia, were very quick behind that. We were only, we commissioned direct link quite shortly after Gotland, but let's say uh, the year 2000, we commissioned that. Um, and then the technology has pretty much grown. The first 320 kV VSC was installed in 2015. Oops, sorry, I forgot this one. The first multi-level VSC was installed in um, commissioned in 20, 2010. Um, and now, as far as what's commissioned, VSC is commissioned to 400 kV, plus or minus 400 kV. And there are 525 kV and possibly 600 kV projects under development or, or close to completion. There's also a point up here about the first uh, LCC project, uh, 1,100, 1 1.1 million volts in China. So LCC continues to be developed and, and, and this slide here shows, you know, overall capacity now. It's uh, the 1.1 million volts is uh, much higher than eight gig gigawatts. So I need to update the, this slide. But basically this is showing that there was a little bit of, in the development of VSC, it was relatively low power, but recently it's shooting up to 1,000, 2,000 megawatts. Whereas the um, with a couple of spurts, the LCC is is kind of getting a bit high, um, sort of levelling out a bit in terms of uh, growth of megawatt value. And this this slide here shows the evolution of VSC. So you can see in early days we we're at the 10 megawatts, uh, 160 Murray Link is 220. Um, so quite a number of years we were sitting at about. For let's say 500 megawatts and below, but then there's been this sudden um, shoot uh, upshot of, of uh, capacity, and you see this all these winds in here: Dole wind, Sil wind, Ball wind. They're all the German offshore wind farms. You know they're up around the 800 megawatt, 600 megawatt kind of level, and then most recently some very large interconnectors are being built, including the rigid bipole systems that we've been talking about. Um, and Elfie up here, which is a little bit of an outlier, is actually a um, France-Spain interconnector and that's sitting at uh, two by a thousand megawatts. And the last slide on the history and development is, is this one. Unfortunately, I haven't updated this for a little while, but basically this shows the uptake in terms of number of projects over the various periods of time. So between 2000 and 2010, there was, there was still a lot of projects being built in LCC and, and not so much in VSC, but fast forward five or six years later and the number of projects at that time between those two years that were that were commissioned is, is actually significantly uh, quite high. This is, this is only in terms of number of projects though, not megawatts. If this was shown in terms of megawatts, then LCC will definitely uh, swamp the pie chart. So just a quick recap on uh, LCC, uh, referred to as conventional uses thyristors, um, requires a synchronous voltage source in order to operate. And because of that fact, it needs a relatively strong uh, network um, to operate. Okay, the LCC requires a synchronous voltage to commutate, i.e. To, to allow the current, to transfer the current flows from one valve to another. So a major disturbance in the AC voltage can 
uh, whether it's a disturbance in the ang phase angle or the magnitude, can cause what we call a commutation failure. Now, commutation failures can happen, and, and a lot of converters can ride through them. But if they're if they're severe and significant enough, um, they can lead to a, a, a tripping of the link. Now, a commutation failure is basically when two valves remain on. So one was supposed to switch out, and the other one was supposed to switch in, but but because of the the disturbance in the AC voltage waveform, they both stay on, and they create a a short circuit on the DC side. Okay, interesting thing about LCC is over the years, um, you know, like I said, it's been out since the 1950s. At the time, a lot of people would would naturally think that the network can only get stronger. And so when you build these, these links, you assume that the network's gonna get stronger over time. But of course, in recent years, the last, last decade, we've seen a gradual reduction in, in the overall strength of the network due to the introduction of inverter connected renewable energy and um, and battery storage for example um, so that's that's LCC it's effectively it's a um, it, it, a typical LCC of normal you know without not the extreme converters um, will be a 12 pulse bridge they have a 30 degree phase shift between each of the six pulses um, and that's that's achieved through the having two transformers, a star star and a and a, um, and a star delta connected in uh, connected in series. Okay, and, and basically the AC network uh, causes each each of the uh, the the voltage causes each of the uh, thyristor valves to commutate at, at various times, leading to this this kind of waveform here. It's got DC waveform. Reversing this process allows an AC waveform to be created, although you, you will expect a fair amount of harmonics in the in the uh, the, the, the voltage that, you, that that's created, and this requires a significant amount of harmonic filtering. The overall conversion process actually requires reactive pa power to 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 feed it or it actually draws reactive power. So, so to minimize the impact on the AC network, you need to feed your converter um, reactive power. What that means is you, you need a number of filters both to handle the harmonics, but also to feed the reactive power requirements of the converter. So what that leads to is, is the, you know, for if we take this example from, uh, from, from Siemens, where it leads to the converter hall and transformers being relatively small, but a, a quite a large footprint being needed to uh, to, to put in all the filters for the uh, for the, for those purposes. So key characteristics need a relatively strong network. Um, converter power station losses tend to be lower in LCC. VSE technology is catching up, but still not quite there. There's still a fair amount of heat loss in the VSCs. Converters require reactive power, so they require um, filters. Um, overhead lines, the LCC process does allow the control of the DC current to uh, close to zero, so you can block the converters and potentially restart. So, so that's why they're very commonly used for overhead line. But they, they do have a large footprint. The converters can be require a fair amount of land. Um, there is also this, this issue with the power electronics where with the thyristors, where there's an inherent minimum power transfer, it's a dead band, typically it's 10% of the rate of capacity. Uh, although some innovations recently, such a, particularly the New Zealand link, have worked out how to utilize uh, bipole systems to, to minimize the impact of that, um, that dead band. Currently 800 kV projects, of course, I've just mentioned the 1,100 kV, and you know they're now up around the eight, nine gigawatt massive, massive projects. So that's LCC. So moving on to VSC. So they use IGBTs, insulated gate bipolar transistors, self-commutating as I mentioned. And the thing about the converters is they use IGBTs to create both an AC waveform and a, volt and a DC voltage waveform, AC voltage and DC voltage. And it, it tries, it needs to create its own AC waveform on whether it's a rectifier or an inverter to allow 
of, of sufficient amplitude and phase angle to allow power, power, active power and reactive power to flow. And I'll, I've, I've got some formulas I'll show you in a second. Now, VSE converters do not require a strong synchronous voltage for commutation. Now, this, this means they're quite, they're, they're popular in, in low, low uh, AC system strength applications. Uh, they can be used to black start a network if you design it appropriately. Um, but uh, so you put an auxiliary supply in there so you can run your control system, your cooling pumps, you create your own AC modulating waveform instead of the controls taking one from the network. Um, so yeah, that's that's pretty much why one of the reasons why they're, they're, they're so popular. But of course, with VSE converters, they can't, they, there is still a lower limit as to how weak the network can be and for it to meet the, the normal generator performance standard requirements. So yes, it will work, but will it meet all your requirements of your grid connection and how low can that, um, that, that system strength or short circuit ratio be? Some key components. So this is a diagram from, uh, from a SIGRAY technical brochure. Uh, shows a converter station. This one is a, is a double symmetric monopole VSC. So a converter, converter station, converter, you have the transformers here. Uh, over here, you can see there's, this, there's a little bit of controversy as to what we call these transformers because technically they're not converter transformers. Um, some people in SIGRAY call them interface transformers. It's a term that's, that's, that's popped up but it's uh, anyway, they're transformers. They go through phase reactors into the converter units. The AC filters may or may not be required depending on which topology you use because different VSC topologies have uh, different uh, numbers and, uh, and um, degree of, of magnitude of, of harmonics, okay? So you may or may not need AC filters depending on what topology you use. These, these are the two formulas. They're, the, um, they're the, the VSC formulas. Basically, there's a power formula and a, and a, and a reactive power formula. It's, it's based on the concept that there's an AC voltage created here at the converter terminal, and there's an AC voltage on the network side, right? And there's a, there's a large inductance in between. So these formulas say that obviously the inductance is a, is a factor, but effectively, if you can change the phase angle, you can cause power to flow in or out of the converter and, and the magnitude of, of that. And the same goes with the amplitude. So if you look at this, this reactive power formula here, by adjusting the amplitude of this voltage waveform that you're creating, by adjusting that amplitude, you can cause reactive power to flow in and out of your converter. Now, the reactive power doesn't flow in the DC lines, obviously, but it, what it means is each converter can independently control, uh, control the, the reactive power flow in and out within the, within the limits of the converter but to a, a very good degree of granularity. And this is where that benefit of uh, uh, some, some companies call it an SVC mode or a stack-com mode. So if you, even if you had a cable failure, you could still operate the converter and provide reactive power support to your network. Okay, uh, next. So generally speaking for a VSC control, there, there are three levels of control. One is, the control at your converter, your rectifier, control across your DC line, and then control at the inverter. But effectively, with a, a, a certain degree of coordination, at the sending end, the rectifier, the converter creates an AC voltage waveform of the appropriate phase angle and magnitude to allow power to flow into the converter. <coughs> at, the, <coughs> at a selected end, um, one converter will hold the DC voltage steady to a, to a known value. The other converter will adjust the DC voltage to cause current to flow one way or the other across the line. And then at the inverter end, the inverter 
creates an AC voltage waveform of the appropriate phase and angle, angle and magnitude to cause power, active power to flow in the other direction. So you can imagine all three controls need to be uh, need to be perfectly matched to make sure that the amount of power going in the rectifier across the line plus losses out through the inverter. And you know effectively that's how a VSC works, regardless of what what the term what the um, topology is. Now because of what I mentioned about being able to independently control the reactive power, each converter can have its own reactive power control. Actually, I'll, I'll go as far as to say each converter must have a, one, a reactive power control and a DC voltage control. So the reactive power control is pretty much the choice, the, the typical choice is reactive power control RPC, where you type in a megabar value, positive or negative, and the converter will do it for you. Or you could put in an AC voltage and have the converter measure the AC voltage and then adjust the reactive power to, to try and maintain that AC voltage set point. And you can see that here in this diagram, um, courtesy of ABB, where, um, where it shows it's measuring, it's got a re reference from the operator, it's measuring the AC voltage and it's, it, it's going into this AC voltage control. Alternatively, you can flick this switch and you can just type in your own Q value. And all of that goes into the overall internal current control, which will cause the converter, as I mentioned, to create an AC voltage waveform of the right amplitude. So they're the two options. And in this case, in this example, you've got both ends are sitting in AC voltage control. Now, um, on the DC voltage control side, as I mentioned about making, making the power flow across the line, you have a DC voltage control and you have an active power control. One converter must be DC voltage control, one must be active power control. If you go into multi-terminal VSCs, it may, it gets a little bit more complicated, but using the point to point, it's quite easy to understand. So you control the voltage at the set point at one end and the other end, which is the end that the operator is typing in at active power set point, is adjusting the DC voltage. So you can see here, um, one converter is in DC voltage control, so it's just holding the DC voltage. The other converter is in is in peak control, and what that is is that's the operator typing in an active power level that they want the converter to transmit, and that goes into the PWM, and that causes the uh, the AC waveform that's being built by the converter to to determine what angle. It's measuring what's on the AC network. It's saying, right, I need to build an AC waveform, voltage waveform of this particular angle. So, so now we know every VSC has to do that. Now, how does it do it depends on the topology. Okay, so, so the topology dictates how you build that AC waveform and how you build that DC voltage. There are three um, three topologies shown here. In terms of uh, chronological order, you can go from left to right. The two-level converter was one of the first, or was the first VSC used in transmission. Uh, three levels were brought in shortly after, and the multi-level, as I've as I mentioned before, have been in since 2010. Uh, it's not to say they're not still building two-level converters. There are still two-level converters being built for smaller power applications. So um, again, in the, uh, in the context of, of projects, uh, direct link is a two level, Murray link is a three level, and um, we don't have a multi-level in Australia yet, but uh, I would imagine that any, any uh, large uh, HVDC system, VSC system that would be built would, would probably be a multi-level of, of a multi-level type. Now, the, so just going through each one, the two level uses pulse width modulation and it basically switches between positive and negative, positive and negative. Uh, in the case of direct link, it's 80 kV positive, 80 kV negative. 
So it's got this switching band of 160 kV switching, bang, 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 uh, 2000 times per second. You can imagine the type of heat that's generating. Uh, it's, it's, um, you know, it's equivalent to when you're operating a computer and, and all, your, uh, all your power electronics has been working pretty hard. You feel that heat being generated from the switching. Imagine that, but each switch is, is 2 kV. Um, so so that's, that's pretty much a two level. It uses a phase reactor as a low pass, uh, sorry, I should say low pass filter to create the sinusoidal AC voltage from the, the high frequency pulse width modulation voltage. So it goes from, from this type of waveform and you can see it pulls out the fundamental mode. It's quite usually quite noisy at this point, so you need a fair amount of AC uh, AC filtering to um, to to get that. This diagram here also shows that the uh, you know what the, what the waveform looks like outside the converter and what it looks like more or less after you've gone through the phase reactor and after you've gone through the AC filters. So that's the two level. The three level is more or less the same, but instead of switching between positive and negative, it's switching between positive and zero, positive and zero, and then zero and negative. The idea is to create a, uh, a waveform at the converter terminals that is closer to looking like an AC waveform. As you can see here, you could draw an AC waveform in here. It looks got your positives and positive side and your negative side. Uh, the, in, to do that, you, you, are, you, you should be able to get away with a, a lower switching um, frequency, right? Maybe not quite half, but, but lower. And lower switching frequency means lower losses. The only issue with the, the three terminal is there's a higher cost. So if you look at this diagram here, there are much more IGBTs in here than there are in the two level, okay? And that means higher capital cost and possibly um, higher operational costs and possibly losses. But it's, um, in any case, it's eventually over time, it was determined that there was a better way to actually reduce switching frequency. And that's the multi-level. So the multi-level is, you know, in my view, if you're building a large VSC, there's a very, very good chance it's going to be a multi-level. Uh, two levels are good for smaller, smaller projects, maybe offshore platforms or, or something or small islands that you're connecting to. But the multi-level really is a, a, a quite a quite a significant breakthrough in in technology. So basically, what this does is what a multi-level is is it uses capacitors that are constantly being charged and discharged by, by the, the submodule switching them in or switching them out or bypassing them completely to build a waveform. And it does it pretty well. So if you look at these diagrams here, uh, which I, I took from a tutorial in, in Canada, they, they effectively, the, the AC wave voltage waveform is measured at this point, and these, and you've got your positive and your, your negative DC voltage. So if you can imagine these these modules here have a have a polarity negative positive negative positive negative positive, and these have negative positive negative positive. So these are seen as positive to the AC voltage, and these are seen as negative to the AC voltage at that point. So in order to create a point on the on, on the zero crossing of your, your AC wave, uh, voltage waveform, when the controls tell the converter, right, I want to be at the zero crossing, what the controls does, it, what the controls do is switch in the same, more or less the same number of IGBTs on that, uh, capacitors on that side as there are on this side. So at this point, it sees a, a voltage of zero. Now, why doesn't it just not switch any of them in? It's because remember what I said before about the converter needs to also build a DC voltage waveform. So here you can see the red line represents the DC voltage, which is more or less a constant voltage it's trying to build. So if you can imagine a very simplified version, 
these capacitors, they're constantly charging and discharging. So they, they change in voltage over time. But if you imagine all of your, all of your capacitors are all 2 kV, then, and you want to create 100, uh, 200 kV positive negative. What that means is you, you have to uh, have 100 capacitors switched in at any one time. Now, if you want a zero crossing, that means that, okay, I've got to switch in 100 of these capacitors to make up 200 kV. So if I switch in uh, 50 at positive and 50 at negative, then they'll negate each other and we'll all have a zero crossing. And that's, that's what the converter does. So when you get to the, the peak of the voltage waveform up here, the same problem still needs to switch in 100, 100 uh, IGBTs because it still needs to hold that 200 kV point. But because I want to be positive, I'll have more of these switched in than those. So depending on the rating of converter, you might have, I don't know, 80 of those switched in and 20 of those. And that process just keeps going uh, as you go through the AC voltage waveform and, and throughout its operation. So this is this is the beauty of the um, of the the MMC. And you can imagine the control system is a pretty busy device right now because it is constantly measuring the voltage across all of these capacitors and it's constantly working out well what's the best combination to make up my 200 kV on the DC side but also to switch in the right amount on the positive and negative side to create my point on the AC voltage waveform. One of the benefits of this technology is that the AC voltage wave profile is actually quite smooth. And I was fortunate enough to be involved in the commissioning of the very first one in, in, a, in the US. And um, I remember when we first de-blocked the converter, the first time we turned it on, and I was reading the, the voltage waveform through the, uh, through the, um, through the os uh, oscilloscope. I remember having, thinking that the, the, the contractor's commissioning manager was playing a practical joke on me because the AC voltage was so, so smooth. Um, and it took a little while for him to convince me that he, he wasn't because, uh, it, and, and that's a converter that has zero uh, filtering. Uh, and just to point down here, the, some variations of this concept are available as well. So this is a, this is a, I guess a true, a pure MMC, which uses capacitors, but there's also other technologies like the cascaded PWM, where they use, instead of using a capacitor as a module, they use a small mini version of a two level converter and then they add those up. So there are some other technologies and I could of course talk for hours about that. So typical components of a VSC. Uh, this is a diagram from, from Siemens, Siemens website. It's, it's basically, this is a symmetric monopole. You've got a, a convert, and it, sorry, this is actually two symmetric monopoles. So there's one here and there's one there. And the, this is the room with stacks of IGBTs connected to capacitors. That's really what's in this room, row upon row, six rows actually to be, to be precise. The phase reactors that I was mentioning before, they, they're sitting out here. There's a control room because these converters require a fair amount of control and protection. And cooling, as I mentioned before, the, there's a lot of switching going on, there's a lot of heat loss generated. And this, um, the, these here are cooling towers and cooling equipment. And, and that's typically what a converter is. It, the interface transformers or the converter transformers are over here connected to a bus bar. And depending on, it may very well be an MMC, but you may have some pretty tight harmonic requirements. Uh, so there may be some filtering in there. It really, um, really depends on your application. Okay, so key characteristics of VSC. Why, why do we like it or, or what, are, what are some of the disadvantages? There are minimal reactive power compensation required. So lower cost and a much lower footprint size for your converter. So you can fit these converters into to pretty neat places, which is one, one of the reasons, not the only reason, but one of the reasons why it's a technology suitable for offshore wind farms, for example. But also if you needed to bring a, a, 
HVDC system into a very heavily populated area like a city, uh, VSC is, is, is ideal for that. Uh, the converter transformers, if you've got it in a symmetric monopole configuration, uh, are very similar to normal AC transformers. They can supply a passive network if you design them correctly. They have a black start capability if you've designed and specified it correctly. And you also, you, you basically can do some pretty neat things with the output. Uh, you have such control over the converter that you, you may be able to use VSE converters, for example, to to help you with an existing harmonic problem at the same time if you needed to. The controllability of reactive power is, is independent of active power transfer and you decide how much reactive power it consumes. You could sit it at zero megavars if you wanted to or you could have it following the voltage or you could have it where you type in 100 megavars and it'll suddenly and, and how fast you want it to ramp to and it'll ramp to that level. Of course, within the within the power um, power levels, rule of thumb is 40% of the active power level. That's how much reactive power you've got. You can make use of extruded polymer cables. I didn't really mention this earlier too much, but with LCC, you need to change the polarity of the voltage to cause power to flow in the other direction. And extruded polymer cables, uh, for for reasons beyond my ken, um, don't like that. So but with, with VSC, in particularly symmetric monopole configuration, you have your positive, you have your negative, and you don't need to, to change, um, change polarity, so you can use polymer cables. Um, the, one disadvantage is very little operational experience with the use of VSC using DC overhead lines. Um, I'll talk about that on the next slide. And although converter station losses are improving in VSC, they are still higher than um, LCC station losses. They are talking, the, the vendors are talking about less than 1%. I've heard numbers like 0.8%. Uh, so the voltage, the losses are getting getting down. And VSC, just by, by way of the equipment being used, can have less overload capability when compared to an LCC system. Um, but it's a, uh, it really depends on where you are in, in terms of the overall, uh, what, what type of module you, you've purchased, how much current is, uh, overhead you have in your, um, in your VSC sub-module. So, overhead lines. So the vast majority of in-service VSC are using half-bridge converters. The half-bridge topology does not allow you to control the DC current to, to achieve any kind of zero, zero crossing to allow you to, uh, to block the converter um, or, or, and, and restart. And, and this, because of this, most of the half, or it could be the other way around, but, but all but one HVDC uh, VSC system is, is using underground or, or submarine cables. There's only one operational right now that actually has an overhead line, and that's a Caprivi link in Africa. And I've got a slide on that um, coming up. But the the others use underground and, and submarine cables. So they assume that if you're going to get a fault on a cable, an underground or a submarine cable, that it's going to be a permanent fault. It's not an intermittent fault. And therefore, you may as well just open the circuit, AC circuit breaker, right? You're not gonna try and restart that. So, so that's pretty much the, the bulk of the VSC at the moment. But of course, with new, new opportunities and new applications, everyone now wants to be able to use VSC on overhead lines. So the difference is that these DC, that DC overhead lines or any overhead line is susceptible to intermittent faults. So you can no longer assume, oh, well, I'm gonna open the circuit breakers every time I get a fault, because you'll have, you'll have a pretty unreliable uh, interconnector if you did that. It's also an issue with the parallel diodes in the, in the, in the VSC submodules that well, they can only handle certain number of faults or extended faults. So, you know, you wanna to, want to be able to operate quite quickly in the event of a fault. 
if you've got an underground cable and you're only expecting maybe two or three in, in a lifetime, that's not such a deal, big deal. But if you're expecting a couple of these a year, then that's something you really want to be able to control that, that DC fault current. So DC circuit breakers are not so easy. You, most of us will understand that an AC circuit breaker opens up on the, on the zero crossing. There's no zero crossing on the DC current. And you've got all this energy stored in the DC system. And sometimes your DC system is connected to a renewable energy source at the other end. So, um, and the need for short interruption times, you want to be able to, to stop that current as quick as you can uh, so that you don't impact your, your parallel diodes. So there are basically two, um, oh, I've got a little comment up there about multi-terminal systems. And it's basically saying, you know, the consideration of DC, how you handle DC, the DC side currents and during faults, is particularly important for multi-terminal because you want to work out, you know, do you keep one one line operational while the other one is unaffected? But uh, I won't really go into that. The point here is there are two main solutions to the problem that are being discussed in the international community right now. There's the DC breaker and there's the full bridge. The DC breaker, okay, it's it's trying to, the the technology, the innovations that are happening right now are trying to trying to create an artificial zero crossing. And the, the most common that you'll see talked about is the hybrid DC circuit breaker, which is where, I've got a diagram of it up here. Um, basically you've got a high speed DC switch it, it, and it's in series with this small low voltage switch. I will make a point, you could you could have it make a DC circuit breaker by basically building a whole lot of IGBTs in series and switching them all out at the same time. That would be very lossy. So it's a technical solution, but I think most, most parties are not, not really looking at that. They're looking at a way to make a low loss DC circuit breaker. So this here, basically when a fault is detected, this, um, the, the commutation branch, which is which is a power electronic device, but it's not always in the circuit, will deep block and, and commutate. And that will, and, and at the same time, we block this low voltage switch. That allow, that basically diverts the current enough so that we can open this, this, this high speed DC switch. <clears throat> in addition, you also have an issue where you've got all this energy that you have to get rid of and so they, the, the current designs are looking at putting an energy absorption branch, which is basically uh, a, a bank of arrestors to, 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 to get rid of that energy um, as, quick, as quick as you can. These things aren't expected to operate very often. They will, of course, then reclose back in, but uh, it's, uh, that's pretty much the design that's being used. To the best of my knowledge, the, the they are commercially available, and you know the last one I personally have seen was two years ago at 100 kV. It's possible that they've gone bigger than that, um, but development is ongoing, and this is a source of innovation in the international DC community. Um, now the full bridge is the difference is shown here. Effectively, it's it's a way of switching that you can you can control the DC fault current to zero by reversing the DC voltages momentarily across the converter arms. And that's, you can only do that with, with the, um, the flexibility that a full bridge switching configuration um, provides. The disadvantage of full bridge is that you need twice as many IGBTs and twice as many IGBTs means more losses. So, so you could, but, the technology is 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 well known. The the theory is is well known, and, and there's not a lot of innovation except in the way the controls actually operate. So so you can go with the the proven technology, but it's costlier and has higher losses versus a technology under development, which may be cheaper. I mean, there's still jury still out as to how much these devices will cost at the higher voltage levels. And just an overhead line example 
Uh, there's a couple of cool things about this project. This is a this is a project in the Caprivi Strip in Africa, so Namibia to Zambia, and, it, and it's been in operation nearly ten well nearly ten ten years now. And it's a uh, it's it's 952 kilometres of overhead line, using guide structures a lot of the way. It's a very interesting project in many ways. The first stage is a monopole. You can see by this picture up here, they have the plans to build the second pole and turn it into a full bipole, um, but it's operating as a monopole. But it has an innovative DC fault line clearing scheme where it temporarily isolates the system by opening both an AC breaker and a DC pole breaker, and then closes them back in. The, the issue here is it takes about 700 milliseconds, so it's pretty slow in comparison to, say, LCC restart capabilities. But it's um, obviously this is, an, this is likely a case where the, the, uh, the system can handle the loss of this interconnector for that period of time. Right. I'm in the home stretch now, so VSC applications. So to talk about all the applications would be, again, another webinar. So just quickly, what are the technologies where VSC technology tends to be preferred? Um, the low power applications, direct link is an example, but um, you know, you get, uh, if, if you wanted to, if you wanted to supply a mine in the middle of nowhere, and you could you could justify a, a converter, uh, a DC power transmission, then you'd, you'd use a VSC at low power. Offshore loads, some distance from the shore. So there are quite a number of, particularly in the North Sea, there are quite a number of projects where the offshore platform is actually fed by a VSC HVDC system. Offshore generation, so that's a picture of an offshore wind uh, converter station. And it's uh, it's one of the ball winds. I'm going to say ball wind one, but uh, that may be corrected. And uh, but in Germany there are quite a number of them, and these are quite large megawatt value projects. They they use they have a collector substation bringing in all the wind generation, then they transmit it a long distance to the shore, uh, up to 800 megawatts. Remote passive loads using overhead lines, as I mentioned, the mining remote mining load example. Interconnection into weak networks, it's another good application. And then the last one, small footprint. Now Transbay Cable is an interesting project. This is this is one I mentioned earlier in San Francisco. So I've taken the liberty of, of grabbing some Google Earth images here to show you that um, the application of this particular project, which was um, a Siemens project and it was the very first MMC project, we um, San Francisco is more or less a peninsula. To the north up here, um, there's some conventional generation and there, is some, uh, there are no, virtually little or no constraints on the transmission network. But then the power to get to the city has to come down the East Bay and up the bottom from the south on the peninsula. That's heavily congested. So what we did was we came along and built a VSC 400 megawatts from up here in the town of the city of Pittsburgh. 80 kilometres of submarine cable into, into the city. Um, and you can see it's in a very populated area and that's what the converter looks like. So that's 400 megawatts, relatively small footprint. You can get a sense with the size of the cars, no AC filtering, everything's in a box and um, nice wall around it and, and beautiful gardens that we put in the front. To the point that I've, I've had friends still in San Francisco who live in the vicinity and have never known there's a converter station there. So it's a, it's a very good example of an application um, utilising that small footprint. So I really am in the home stretch. I've got three slides to go. So um, what's happening in VSE? Big projects, uh, 1400 megawatts, 515 kV, the introduction of the Richard Bipole and the North Sea link will be 720 kilometres, and that's going to be um, commissioned next year. But then we look at China. China's building some some massive, massive VSC projects. So they've got a, a five gigawatt VSC station currently under construction. Um, and the Jiangbei four terminal VSC link, which will be commissioned 
over the over the coming year is is actually a four terminal uh, VSC with their own design of DC breaker. And you can see by the diagram here, these aren't small converters either. They're three gigawatts, one and a half gigawatts, with with some um, reasonably long lines, and and the use of DC breakers. So there are papers, there are SIGRE papers available on on these kind of um, projects. And then there's there's the idea of the hybrid, and and this is where you take the the benefits of one technology and the and of the other, and 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 discount the the cons. So this is an interesting one up here. This is this is a concept or it's a project under development where they need to go from a hydro station to the loads, uh, understanding that uh, a VSC is a more robust solution into these these kind of loads. They're proposing to make the inverters VSC, but the rectifier uh, LCC. So where the eight gigawatts, it's taking advantage of the low losses of the um, of the LCC and of course it's going to be a very strong connection so and, and the rectifier you you generally only have commutation failure issues on the inverters so it's it's a it's a nice solution taking the benefits of both technologies and the final one here is an interesting one that, that people are really starting to look into now and before I mentioned you had a choice of half bridge versus full bridge the idea here is well, can you can you install just the right amount of full bridge modules to control the fault current and get away with the rest of the modules being just half bridge? And the short answer is apparently yes, you can. And they're installing one, um, they're building one in China right now. And the the paper that I've got is saying that they've managed to get reduce the the number of full bridge modules needed to about 70%. Uh, so the other 30% are all half bridge. That'll reduce losses and that'll lower the cost of the converter. So that's the end of my presentation. So uh, thank you all for listening. I apologise, it's a lot of information in a very relatively short period of time. Um, and I do welcome any any thoughts after this webinar about any particular area that I've touched on where you see that there may be a benefit for a um, a more detailed webinar on that particular topic. But I guess, Matt, I'll throw it back over to you. Thanks, Les. You're immaculate on timing, mate. Almost 15 minutes left to the to the minute. Um, so in terms of questions I have seen throughout, there's been a good number of questions come in. What we might try and aim for is 10 minutes of questions. I'm not sure if that'll be enough for us to get through all, um, all of the ones that were posed, but we'll aim for 10 minutes of questions with five minutes just for a bit of a wrap up and close out. So Maddie, I believe you've been monitoring the chat line throughout. Are you uh, are you able to come off mute? Yep, can you hear me? Yeah, we got you there. Um, are you are you comfortable to, to pose some of those questions to Liz? Yep, I'll just go through them uh, as they came in sort of chronologically through the presentation. And, and yeah, we probably won't get through all of them, but I've noted them all down, so we can try and get back to you over email um, if that works. Yeah, so, you can firstly, take the floor, yeah. <laughs> so firstly, in relation to the major HVDC technologies, so LCC compared to VSC, we had a couple of questions around um, how in applications you make the choice between LCC and VSC. Um, so what are some of the criteria that you look at? I know you touched on this less a bit in terms of low power um, applications and hybrid uh, uh, links, but do you want to maybe elaborate a bit more on that? Yeah, sure. Uh, the So the pros and cons, there are some very clear pros and cons when it comes to LCC versus VSC. The Probably the, the I'm going to say the top couple that I would think of that, that tend to push the technology one direction or the other. One is system strength, particularly system strength at the inverter end. So if you have an interconnector and you're connecting into a weak network and you're expecting to transmit power into that weak network, you will probably avoid um, you know, now nowadays with the, with the higher megawatt values available in VSC, 
you will probably go for a VSC type solution. Um, and uh, and intermittent and if you've got intermittent generation at the at the rectifier, you will probably go for a VSC solution. You can you can use LCC, but it would be a tricky thing to to, uh, to do. Uh, other an, another important aspect is the footprint size, which I embellished on towards the end of the presentation. So VSC converters can be quite compact. They don't require acres or not acres, but a, a large uh, meter square area for purely for AC filters. And of course, if you're in a weaker network, then requiring the switching in and out of AC filters will will have an impact because you know, switching in of uh, 50, 90, 80, 90 megavars may actually cause problems with your AC network. So they're the kind of things that, that you would think of. And then probably the final thing would be what are the other ben are the other benefits of VSC useful in your project? So if you have a VSC, so the VSC can control reactive power pretty well. So if if you can really if your network can really do with that kind of uh, additional benefit, then then again that may push push it over the line. Thanks for that, Les. Uh, and the next question came in surrounding the different uh, HVDC configurations, so with the rigid bipole configuration. Um, so you talked a bit about how the rigid bipole configuration provides redundancy against faults. Uh, so if the converter fails uh, in the bipole configuration, the metallic return can be used as an HV conductor. Could you please um, clarify um, sort of how that process works for that configuration? Yeah, well, short answer is that's what it, it that, that is what it does. It uses <laughs> um, it the so if we look at the diagrams, I've, I've put put the diagrams up again, and red is an open circuit breaker, right? So in this case, the converter has failed here. So let me go over to here. The two circuit breakers here have opened and this one is closed. So it's now bypassed that converter. And it is using, see where this 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 line here, which was previously the the uh, the high voltage conductor, is being used at um, zero kV. So the, the the negative conductor or cable is now being used as a metallic return. I think awesome, thanks for that. Yeah, I think that, that clarifies it. Um, the next question we had was in regards to your brief summary on LCC technologies, and it was what is considered as a high short circuit ratio for LCC? It's, it's a, the rule of thumb is about uh, two. Yeah. But as with everything, it, everything depends. So you you would have to do your studies, but um, but the rule of thumb I've used in in the past has been, you know, if you're less than if you need less than two, then I'm, I'm almost always like focusing in on the VSC solution. Yeah. Okay. Thanks for that. The next question was in regards to the VSC control modes, and uh, it was how are the different reference values for the control modes generated to be fed into the control system? So how's the Q reference generated for reactive um, power control and that sort of thing? Okay, so just fast forward to that. There we go. So the Q ref, these are actually operator inputs. Okay, so if you're in reactive power control, then it's it's up to the operator to decide what reactive power level you would like. Think of it as kind of the um, the switchable portion of a stack com. If you had a stack com with a, a switchable uh, capac capacitor bank and, and you want to offset it, so maybe you may want to use it in, in that way where you, you, you set it at a value and you let some other device control your, um, your voltage. But the, the AC voltage reference, if you're in AC voltage control, you just work out in your, just in the normal manner in which a, a system operator will determine what voltage they want to operate at. You just enter that value into your, um, 
into your controls and the converter will will generate and absorb reactive power within the limits of, within the ratings of the converter. Cool. Uh, the next question was again in relation to the control modes. Uh, does it matter which side is the inverter or rectifier in terms of the DC control end or active power control end for VSC? Mm, that's a good question. In LCC it does. In VSC, I'm going to say not really uh, because it's just really, um, hang on, I'm trying to think this one through. I, I haven't been in a position where I've where I've had to had to define that, um, but but typically your rectifier would be your active power controller. If you look at the traditional HPC, and, you, um, and your inverter would be it would be your DC voltage control source. But um, with AC, with VSC, I've seen them operated in both, so uh, I, I can't think of a, a, a smart answer to that off the top of my head. Sorry. <laughs> no, that's fine. That was a fairly good answer. Um, then we had a couple of questions around the modular multi-level converters. So firstly, given that these systems uh, have fundamentally more um, parts to them, are there any issues with reliability? And then from that, if the system loses one of the switching modules, does the whole converter stop working? Ah, good question. Um, all VSCs and, and LCCs, regardless of topology, will have some degree of redundancy built into them. So if you're a VSC, if you're at a, a two level or a three level, you, you've got a certain number of switches that are all operating at exactly the same time. You may have a few more in there that um, are designed to fail short so that you've got the right amount of um, voltage distribution across all your ITVTs that are left. Okay, so that's there's so there's generally an inherent yeah. redundancy there. For the MMC, same thing applies. It's it's just um, you you put in more modules so that if any of these fail, they bypass. All right, and there are different technologies, different ways in which which the bypass is done they will bypass, they'll take themselves out of the circuit. And because you've got enough capacitors to cover that number, then um, you know the converter will continue to operate. Of course, there'll be a protection in there that will say, when you get close to your number, it'll give you an alarm. When you, when you exceed that number, it'll, it'll, it'll trip the converter. Yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> Um, then there was another question in relation to MMC um, with reference to technical brochure 604. Um, so how is, what are some of the criteria for selecting between the different um, modulation techniques such as cascaded PWM, um, nearest level modulation and um, the multi-level converter modulation? What are some of the criteria for picking which one to use? Well, up until recently, it was it was actually just uh, a product that's provided by one vendor and by another vendor. It was more of a, a vendor preference. Uh, to be fair, I I haven't had enough experience with the cascaded PWM to know whether there are any pros and cons with that technology. Um, I, I haven't heard of any uh, that would differentiate it from an M uh, the, an MMC using using capacitors, but um, ultimately, when you are comparing the technologies, you look at things like losses, you look at footprint, you look at whether or not it needs uh, filtering, and from there that will that will help you determine which which technology will um, will will suffice for for, for your application. <coughs> Yep, and I think we've got time for one last question. Um, so I might go to a question that was asked at the end. So Austra the Australian power system is integrating a lot more converter-based renewables, which means less inertia and um, fault level. What may be the impact for VSC 
be in such a system? It's, it needs to be treated at the moment, a, a VSC converter needs to be treated more or less as a um, as an inverted connected renewable energy source in, in that respect. Um, obviously, if you've got an interconnector, you have a, a, a huge amount of generation source behind it uh, or power source behind it. Uh, compared to if it was say a wind farm or a solar farm connected on the end where you've only got access to power at um, at certain times when generation is available. But a VSC can can allow you to, if you take the interconnector example and you've got a, a lot of power, you've got all the power you need available at the, uh, at the rectifier, you can provide a form of fast frequency response and that just reminds me, I, I did gloss over that in my one of my slides, where fast frequency control is becoming a a possible a, a, an option that that's being selected or, or or specified, and that's where at your receiving end you pretty much say, well, we want you to control the the frequency here, or and or if the frequency goes outside of a certain range, we want you to um, interfere and provide more power or less power. Or, or run back your power in a way to help control that, that frequency. So that's like a fast frequency response. Now the idea of synthetic inertia, synthetic inertia is of course being discussed at an international level. There was a task force with SIGRA B4 quite recently and um, the outcome of that was recommendation of it, uh, that yes, it's a, something that needs to be explored and a new working group will is has been started recently or will be started very soon to look into synthetic inertia. My understanding is there are still issues with that and they the the converters have not got to a point where they can provide um, synthetic inertia, in particular in the ability to provide fault current, which is what conventional generators can do. That's that's been an issue. Um, but also how quickly it can uh, it can actually respond. So at this point in time, VSC converters can help with your 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 um, your AC network issues and lack of inertia issues only in in, a, in by providing some degree of of fast frequency control if you if you specify it like that. Oh, thanks for answering those questions, Les. And I've noted down the questions that we didn't get to, so um, we'll try and get answers for everyone and send them back by email. And I'll pass it over to Matt to close out. Yeah, thanks very much Hello, for that. Everybody. Really appreciate um, you facilitating the questions there. And again, I guess as a as a bit of a close out, Les, thank you very very much for your time. I really do appreciate it. It was extremely in depth, and I've got, uh, as someone who hasn't worked in HVDC very much at all, I've, I've got a lot better appreciation than I did an hour and a half ago. So I really appreciate that. Also, a big thanks to Maddie for for um, helping organise and facilitate this session. Um, I guess to jump back to to a a note that Les started this meeting off with. Les has offered to the potential to do a deep dive on in some of the areas that he's spoken about today with with his colleagues in B4. So what we're going to try and do, or what we will do, time um, time may be a little bit variable at this point, but we'll get out a, a survey to NGN members to see where you would be interested in hearing more uh, from today's presentation. So we'll, we'll work with, then once we get a response on that, we'll work with Les to arrange a, a presentation later this year that follows up on that and, and does a bit more of a deep dive into the specifics of, of HVDC and um, BSC technologies. So watch your emails for that one. Um, the recording of this presentation should be available in the next week or so. Again, that will, um, come out via email and that email will include the, the prompt about a survey for a deep dive session. Uh, and lastly, I wanted to, to finish by uh, putting in a plug for our next event. So our June presentation will be held on the 19th of June. Uh, and it's a presentation by Professor Gerard Ledwich of QUT. 
who will be talking about control strategies addressing inverter impacts on the network. So if you're an NGN member, you can expect to see an email about this uh, later this week um, advertising that event. It hasn't actually um, been fully advertised yet, otherwise it will be appearing on the Sea Grey Australia events page. But um, to finish off, um, I'll, leave, I'll leave the details on that closing slide for a little bit longer. Um, it does have Les's details. Again, if you get in contact with Les with any follow-up questions, I, I guess appreciate that he's extremely busy uh, and may not be able to respond immediately. Uh, similarly, if you have any questions for the NGN, uh, please do get in touch on, on that email address. But Les, thank you very, very much. Really do appreciate your time um, and the amount of effort that's gone into pulling together such a, such a detailed presentation. My pleasure. Thanks, Matt, Maddie, and thanks to everyone for uh, for listening in. Okay. Thanks very much.